Pentagon Papers whistleblower and longtime peace activist Daniel Ellsberg died at the age of 92 on June 16th. Media organizations published their obituaries and spent much of the last four or five days celebrating Daniel Ellsberg's life. Some of the U.S. media segments were all too familiar to people who had followed Dan in the latter part of his life as he stood up for whistleblowers like Chelsea Manning and Edward Snowden. Although this time, media producers and editors did not have to worry about Dan contacting them. Michael Ellsberg, one of Daniel Ellsberg's sons, tweeted, 100, Daniel absolutely rejected what he called the Ellsberg good, Assange Manning Snowden bad, media narrative that used him as a foil against them. Any journalist advancing this story should at least have the honesty to note that Daniel thoroughly rejected it. Michael also posted, pundits are out praising my father as a way of denouncing Snowden, Chelsea Manning, Assange, and modern whistleblowers by comparison. Daniel is on record vehemently rejecting praise of him used for this cynical purpose. Media, please at least mention that fact. One of the examples which Michael focused on in particular came from PBS NewsHour when David Brooks and Jonathan Capehart were asked to comment on Daniel Ellsberg's life. David Brooks is a New York Times pundit and a human vanilla wafer. Jonathan Capehart is a Washington Post pundit and someone who gives off real hall monitor energy. They were both on PBS NewsHour and they had this to say. Well, we've just spent several minutes talking about classified documents should not be taken out of where they <laughs> belong in the Donald Trump context. And I generally agree with that. I think most leakers uh, are wrong. I thought Edward Snowden was terrible. But Daniel Ellsberg shows that you can do it right. And so he did it over many years. He tried to go up the normal chain of command to show documents to senators and other things. And so it was, he went through all the hoops you should go through to prove that it's not just you being an egomaniac, it's you with a legitimate cause. And then when he finally leaked those 7,000 documents to the Times and then eventually the Post, um, you could at least say, well, he, A, went through all the hoops, B, did it with the full expectation he'd spend the rest of his life in jail. Mm -hmm. And so that, to me, is doing it the right way, a, a thing that probably should almost never be done except in extreme circumstances, which he was in. I think he'll be remembered as a hero, someone who stood up for principles, someone who had a strong belief and then tried to do something about it. I, I, I agree with David. I would add one more thing, because you mentioned the name Edward Snowden, and a lot of people were comparing the two when Snowden leaked all of those documents saying he's the modern day Ellsberg. And I wrote a column then, 10 years ago this week, that said, no, he's not. Because while they both leaked documents, Daniel Ellsberg did something Edward Snowden didn't do. He stayed in this country, he turned himself in, and he um, allowed himself to be held accountable, something Edward Snowden still refuses to do. And in that regard, that's why I say someone like Daniel El Ellsberg should be considered a hero, because he did something um, that stood up for his, for his beliefs and his value system and then suffered the consequences. Both of these pundits are conceited individuals. They are more concerned with insignificant columns that they wrote 10 years ago attacking Edward Snowden and how right now they are paying tribute to Daniel Ellsberg who supported Edward Snowden. And they know they are on the wrong side of history and people are looking at them and they can't bring themselves to let Daniel Ellsberg have his support for Edward Snowden without bringing their egos into this tribute to Dan Ellsberg. David Brooks published a column on June 10th, 2013, called The Solitary Leaker. It came one day after Edward Snowden revealed his identity. It took David Brooks one day to determine that Edward Snowden had betrayed basically everything possible in this world. For society to function well, David Brooks wrote, there have to be basic levels of trust and cooperation, a respect for institutions and deference to common procedures. If 
by deciding to unilaterally leak secret NSA documents. Snowden has betrayed all of these things. He betrayed honesty and integrity, the foundation of all cooperative activity. He made explicit and implicit oaths to respect the secrecy of the information with which he was entrusted. He betrayed his oaths. Later in this column, he wrote, he betrayed the Constitution. The founders did not create the United States so that some solitary 29-year-old could make unilateral decisions about what should be exposed. Snowden self-indulgently short-circuited the democratic structures of accountability, putting his own preferences above everything else. Jonathan Capehart also wrote a column. It was headlined, Snowden failed to follow Ellsberg's example. And it came four days after Snowden's identity became known. And he really went after the fact that people were comparing Snowden to Daniel Ellsberg. Enough with the breathless comparisons. Edward Snowden is no Daniel Ellsberg. I know the latter has heaped praise on the former, but the high-mindedness of our present-day national security leaker is nowhere near the gutsiness of the man who changed the course of the Vietnam War by releasing the Pentagon Papers more than 40 years ago. Armed with an intimate knowledge of what was happening in the Vietnam War, Jonathan Capehart argued, Ellsberg faced a crisis of conscience about the actions of his country. Before going to the press, he tried to enlist the help of Congress. When it came time to be held accountable for his actions, Ellsberg didn't leave his family or his country. He stayed right here, to face the consequences of leaking top secret documents. Knowing this, Snowden's preaching from the other side of the world is a bit hard to take. Except Daniel Ellsberg was published by the Washington Post and Jonathan Capehart conceded. Ellsberg has a point on Snowden. Daniel Ellsberg wrote, in a column that was headlined, Snowden made the right call when he fled the U.S. Many people compare Edward Snowden to me unfavorably for leaving the country and seeking asylum rather than facing trial as I did. I don't agree. The country I stayed in was a different America a long time ago. After the New York Times had been enjoined from publishing the Pentagon Papers on June 15, 1971, the first prior restraint on a newspaper in U.S. history, and I had given another copy to the Washington Post, I went underground with my wife, Patricia, for 13 days. My purpose, quite like Snowden's in flying to Hong Kong, was to elude surveillance while I was arranging with the crucial help of a number of others still unknown to the FBI to distribute the Pentagon Papers sequentially to 17 other newspapers in the face of two more injunctions. The last three days of that period was in defiance of an arrest order. I was, like Snowden, a fugitive from justice. Yet when I surrendered to arrest in Boston, having given out my last copies of the papers the night before, I was released on personal recognizance bond the same day. Later, when my charges were increased from the original three counts to 12, carrying a possible 115-year sentence, my bond was increased to $50,000. But for the whole two years I was under indictment, I was free to speak to the media. And at rallies and public lectures, I was, after all, part of a movement against an ongoing war. Helping to end that war was my preeminent concern. I couldn't have done that abroad, and leaving the country never entered my mind. There is no chance that experience could be reproduced today, let alone that a trial could be terminated by the revelation of White House actions against a defendant that were clearly criminal in Richard Nixon's era and figured in his resignation in the face of impeachment, but are today all regarded as legal, including an attempt to incapacitate me totally. I hope Snowden's revelations will spark a movement to rescue our democracy, but he could not be part of that movement had he stayed here. There is zero chance that he would be allowed out on bail if he returned now, and close to no chance that, had he not left the country, he would 
have been granted bail. Instead, he would be in a prison cell like Chelsea Manning in Communicado. Jonathan Capehart responded, I have no rebuttal to Ellsberg here. The U.S. is a different country now. The terrorist attacks of September 11th, 2001 ensured that. So too did the enemy this nation now confronts. One not bound by borders or that has a titular head. With the new and expanded surveillance powers granted by Congress and then upheld and expanded further by secret rulings and secret courts, there are legitimate concerns and questions raised by Snowden and what he has revealed. With Daniel Ellsberg dead, David Brooks and Jonathan Capehart did not have to concern themselves with how the Pentagon Papers whistleblower would correct them this round. They were able to push forward and argue, as media pundits have routinely over the last decade, that Daniel Ellsberg was the good leaker and that Edward Snowden was the bad leaker. And in the case of Jonathan Capehart, it was even more audacious because we have an actual post where he concedes that Daniel Ellsberg is right and that he was wrong. And yet he still marked the anniversary of his garbage column scolding Edward Snowden for being a whistleblower. Daniel Ellsberg was interviewed by NPR in 2013. And this is what he had to say about doing it the right way, as Jonathan Capehart or David Brooks might say. I would say I did it the wrong way. I wasted years of trying to do it through channels, first within the executive branch and then with Congress. During that time, more than 10,000 Americans died and probably more than a million Vietnamese. So that's not a point of pride with me that I did what I should have done going through channels. That was uh, a fruitless effort, as it would have been for Manning and Snowden. What's abundantly clear is if Daniel Ellsberg came forward today, he would not be supported by U.S. pundits like David Brooks or Jonathan Capehart. He released 4,000 documents, and they contained the names of Americans, Vietnamese, and North Vietnamese. There was even a clandestine CIA officer that was named in those documents. There's no way that someone like Brooks or Capehart would not have joined in the chorus of people from within the national security state and outside of it to condemn Daniel Ellsberg for endangering lives. During one of Daniel Ellsberg's last speaking events, four weeks before he died, he made this point. The assumption is by virtually all reporters as an assumption unquestioned that a crime has been committed by breaking the regulations of these things. Of course, there is a crime. Now let's ask what we think about it and how it should be prosecuted and how it should be punished and what we think about it and so forth. But it's taken it for granted that there has been a crime in the United States of America when truth is told to the public about government operations. Right. That's false. Right. And the reporters have lived comfortably with this delusion in my lifetime, throughout the lifetime, lived with the uh, willingness, starting with me, to use an espionage act that was never intended against giving people who had given information to the American public, but to spies. It had only been applied to spies who secretly gave information to a foreign government, especially during war. And to use that law uh, against somebody who's giving information to the American public is, in the eyes of many lawyers, I'm not a lawyer, I, I'm a defendant, uh, <laughs> but in the eyes of many legal scholars on this, is blatantly con constitutional. Daniel Ellsberg is right. What's most troubling about US media pundits like David Brooks and Jonathan Capehart is that they accept the idea that coming forward with information is a crime. And if we want to do anything to honor and continue to set the example that Daniel Ellsberg set for all of us, we can reject this notion that truth telling is something that should be criminalized by this government because our freedoms, our liberties, our rights, and everything else that we hold dear might depend on it.